and oh. so that's what everybody did. <laughs> <laughs> Jen had her head Okay, down. I'd like to welcome you all to the Sustainability Advisory Board meeting on Monday, June 6th. And one, two, three, we do have quorum. Do we have anyone who would like to make public comment tonight? If, oh, excellent. If you could step up here to the microphone, please. And please just give us your name and where you're from. Uh, my name is Ann Homsey, and I'm visiting from Greenville, North Carolina. Awesome. And I arrived yesterday, and I had kind of an agenda because um, I'm involved in my own city of Greenville, North Carolina with uh, several things. One of them is um, working with the Master Gardeners, and we're looking at uh, building bioswells, or I'm actually initiating the idea of doing bioswells and uh, rain gardens um, in an area with a, a new construction. And so I'm kind of very interested in seeing what you've done here in uh, Oshkosh, because I have seen nothing like this in Greenville. Uh, my daughter, Samara, on your board, took me around to see some of the bioswells and gardens here, and I applaud all the efforts you've made. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing. I'm glad you had a good tour guide. You had one of the best. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the May 2nd meeting. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Were they correct? I was not here for that meeting. <laughs> you noticed I didn't vote. <laughs> Okay, next we are honored tonight to have James Robbie, who is the Director of Public Works. Did I get the title right? Yes. Um, he is here to talk to us because he had been at a meeting I was at um, a month or two ago, and I was so impressed with the information he had to share about infrastructure and many ways that it relates to us. Um, if he, he was sharing things that I'm like, oh, now I get why what we tried to pass wouldn't work or whatever so I wanted him to share it with all of you so take it away James well I'm going to try and remember everything I said at the uh, Commission uh, chair meeting uh, no guarantees though uh, I'm going to start by passing around a couple of handouts um, actually I'll just send them both this way They're two separate handouts so just grab one of each of them um, what they are and really the, the purpose behind the two of them is just to illustrate how things change um, even year to year as we look at um, our infrastructure improvements and you know, primarily in this case as it relates to our street reconstruction program um, one of the uh, the big things I, I think that um, you know a lot of people you know don't get a good opportunity to understand is the fact that there's more to a street reconstruction project than just reconstructing the street um, you know, there are certainly streets uh, that due to their pavement surface condition uh, absolutely warrant being reconstructed, uh, but however the utilities underneath uh, might be, you know, in very good condition yet, so maybe the street doesn't get reconstructed, but, you know, we do some maintenance activities to prolong the life of the streets. Oh, sorry, Scott. <laughs> Can you start over? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> we could hear it. We're just distant. Okay. <laughs> that, that's my new vocal projection, Scott. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so there may be instances where, you know, we have to go through a maintenance activity just to prolong the surface of the street until we get to a point where, you know, we're not replacing utilities that maybe have 50% of their life left. Uh, so there's a... Uh, we kind of um, affectionately refer to it as a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle in our office uh, because it is not just the street surface that we're looking at it's the water main the sanitary sewer the storm sewer and all of those other utilities underneath it that you know we're really looking at um, trying to make sure we're maximizing uh, the effective life out of all of those utilities before coming in and doing a complete uh, reconstruction project um, so the um, the one graphic uh, that uh, the, the two graphics that I passed around one is you know the five-year plan from 2016 to 2020 uh, and then the one with the uh, big draft uh, plastered across it is uh, the current draft of the 2017 to 2021 
five-year street reconstruction program. Um, this is extremely preliminary at this point. Uh, we're still trying to balance everything and, and make sure that you know, we're meeting some of the, con the constraints that we're given as far as budgetary uh, restrictions on the capital improvement program. And then um, we'll go through the capital improvement program uh, review process with finance director, city manager, and then uh, with council and uh, various boards and committees that uh, have opportunities to look at it and you know um, determine that it's you know, in conformance with approved plans. What's the pink mean? Uh, the pink on the two maps is what is the sidewalk rehabilitation area. So that is areas where we're going through and looking at sidewalks to make sure we don't have joint deflections in excess of a half an inch. We don't have areas where sidewalks have settled and uh, they collect and hold or pond water. Um, so yeah, the pink areas in the, in the draft 2017 to 2021, you'll notice um, it's kind of separated a little bit on the west side of the city and then again on the far northeast side of the city. Um, only the current or the first year in the capital improvement program is shown on on the maps for that uh, it would just be too difficult to uh, attempt to try and show all the various years so we just do show the the first year so in the draft one that would just be the 2017 area and then in the the 16 to 20 plan it's just the 2016 area shown one of the questions that I had had for you at, at the previous meeting was, well, I had two that, one was why can't we put um, power lines and stuff underground or the phone lines or whatever is ab above ground? And the other one was why, why is it difficult to replant terrace trees or to plant terrace trees every time a road's built? Can you kind of address some of the answers you gave me about, yeah. and that was the 3D jigsaw, I get it. <laughs> yeah, that, that certainly is another, uh, another whole part of that 3D jigsaw puzzle. And we'll start with the undergrounding of utilities. Um, certainly if you look at new development, new subdivisions and new industrial parks, all of the you know, electric and you know, telephone, cable, all those things are underground. It's very easy when you're starting with a greenfield site to construct everything underground right from the start. Um, when you come, that's standard practice with new developments. Um, it is fairly standard. Yes. Um, you know, if you were to go out and take a look at like um, the expansions in the Casey's Meadow subdivision, those are all underground. Um, I think even some of the earlier phases out there are all underground. So it is certainly um, a direction that they're heading, only to a certain voltage, however. Um, once you get up into the higher voltages of electrical lines, you know, like the 69,000 or the 110,000, you know, the safety distances required to be underground are so substantial that it really makes it impossible for all the other utilities that need to go underground to be underground. So it's just, you know, the local electrical at that point or, you know, some of the lower voltage three phase in the case of the industrial park that they're able to get underground safely. So yeah, newer developments are all coming in with underground being the plan. Um, to go back into some of the older areas of the community and try to reconstruct, you know, I'll use electrical as an example. To reconstruct the electrical 100% underground um, in order to do that would require every single home in that area to upgrade their service and their electrical box in their house because the electrical services the electrical panels in those homes unless they've been recently replaced and upgraded would not comply with current codes which they would need to be brought up to in order to accept an underground feed. So that is one of the biggest challenges with trying to underground in um, especially the longer developed areas of the community. Um, as, as far as uh, the, the planting of terrace trees, um, one big thing to keep in mind there is there are a lot of things under the ground in the street right of way. Um, natural gas is one of them. Um, typically 
when we're doing a street reconstruction project Wisconsin Public Service does reconstruct their facilities uh, both electric and gas as needed um, a lot of the gas service or gas mains and services do need to be replaced just because they're older materials and they want to replace them to get them up to current standards um, they try to get those under the sidewalk if they can um, if they can't get them under the sidewalk their next goal is to get them out of the street pavement so that would mean in the terrace um, there are also other locations where um, if we've got a large water transmission main a lot of times some of those end up being located in the terrace um, just because of you know constraints of you know the water in the sanitary sewer by state administrative code have to be a minimum of eight feet separated from each other so by the time you start trying to put the water the sanitary and the storm sewer in there and, and maintain those separation distances sometimes things might end up in the terrace or in the sidewalk and that's where it does become a challenge to try to put a lot of terrace trees in some areas um, I know we've worked with the city forester as he's you know been looking at some of the terrace tree planting programs he would he'll let us know where they're looking at doing them and we'll look at our utilities and you know I can remember a couple instances you know in the last five years where we've gone back to him and said you know what on this street from this block to this block you just can't do it there's a 16 inch water main in that terrace or the sanitary sewers over in the other terrace or or something like that so it becomes a, a challenge with where all the utilities end up getting located to try to put those terrace trees back in in some cases certainly in cases where we're able to keep the utilities out and the terraces are large enough to support um, a tree you know definitely you know we work with the forester to be able to, to try and implement those where they can but you know sometimes it just doesn't work the way we'd all like it to which makes a lot of sense but we didn't know that when we attempted to write a terrace tree ordinance <laughs> so that information wasn't included in it yeah and that's you know that uh, that really becomes a lot of the interdepartmental coordination and communication you know that um, you know we're we were very glad when the forester came and said hey here's what I'm looking at doing we're like, whoa, 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 time out no you know we, we need you to not do this in a couple of these locations because otherwise you know we're going to be going out and having to fix utilities or you know if it's a sanitary sewer you know tree roots infiltrating into the sanitary sewer you know one that opens up a clear water infiltration into the sanitary sewer which means you know we're overloading the sanitary sewer with the clear water because it's not designed for that and two the roots will actually block the sanitary sewer and cause backups into homes so those are some of the critical things that we you know, we really need to be cautious of and look out for um, you know I, I know in the past you know the equipment that we had at streets division we weren't able to do some of the inspections on some of the larger sanitary sewer mains so in the last four or five years we've been actually bringing in contracted um, companies to help us do those inspections and in one case we actually found an 18 inch diameter sanitary sewer that was almost completely blocked with a tree root ball the roots had gotten in through little seams in the in the pipe and of course the nutrients in sewage you know the tree just kept <laughs> sending more and more roots in there and you know all of a sudden it just completely clogged an 18 inch sanitary sewer which you know a sanitary sewer of that size is serving many you know many city blocks I mean your typical sanitary sewer serving you know you know even up to a dozen city blocks is only an eight inch pipe you know so so by the time you're you know you're you're pulling you know a large part of the city by the time you're getting into an 18 inch pipe what are the pipes that are this big around that are elliptical shape elliptical shape pipes are typically going to be storm sewer but we you were talking about sanitary so yes um, sanitary sanitary sewer um, typically we're not going to go with concrete and all the elliptical pipes are concrete the reason we typically don't go with concrete on a sanitary sewer especially in the big pipes is sanitary waste as it begins to decompose in the pipes produces hydrogen sulfide and that just destroys concrete so you know if we're getting into a case where we got a big interceptor you know we're looking at various other material types for those sure. pipes uh, but certainly you know if you've driven around any of our street reconstruction projects in the last four or five years you know, you've certainly seen some very large concrete pipe going in the ground and that's storm sewer live at evergreen oh 
Okay. <laughs> so you'll be watching some of that going in this year. <laughs> I think we started with a 54-inch round at the outfall, and uh, by the time we get right out in front of Evergreen, we're pretty tight on cover, so we went into some large uh, elliptical at that point to be able to make sure we could keep cover over the pipe uh, when the street gets reconstructed. Um, anybody who lives over on the, you know, the, the east side, just take a drive down by Bowen Street. They're putting five foot high by eight foot wide box covered in for storm sewer. Um, we've done that in a number of other locations just to try oh. to get the capacity that we need. That's interesting because what little I know about the theory of water flow, I wouldn't think a, a rectangular shape would work as well as a circular, but it, that's not true. You can. Yeah, it, it certainly does, and what it does, you know, if you can imagine a circle, right. you know, you've got to get up into the middle of that circle to get a lot of volume, right. whereas with a rectangular shape, you, you know, you're uh, seeing a constant volume, so we're actually able to um, move okay. more water through it, uh, but it is more expensive, so again, we only get into it where we have maybe de pipe depth or cover issues or just a, a significant capacity challenge that we need to overcome. I think one of the biggest challenges with the storm sewer system that we do need to overcome is Lake Winnebago. 99.5% of our storm sewers outfall to the lake below normal water level. So that means the pipe is always submerged and there's always lake level kind of backing up the system. So you're, we're really relying on water's ability to seek its own level. So you know, if it's all at a level and you put a little water in up here, it, it pushes its way out. But do it, you know, being submerged like that reduces its ability to move water, so we got to go bigger with the pipes to meet our needs. Does the Army Corps tell you when they're dropping lake level then? Uh, yeah, actually, do the you have a schedule for that? The, the Army Corps has a very, very detailed plan on their Lake Winnebago management. Mm -hmm. um, they have, at a minimum, quarterly updates on the Lake Winnebago. They do them uh, via conference call quarterly. Uh, they have an annual meeting, typically in Appleton, typically in October. Um, I've attended that meeting most of the last 10 years. Because uh, you need that so you can do management at your end. If there's a big storm coming in and the lake is still really high, and it gives you a plate, you know where to and, and that be is, watching for problems. And that is one of the things that the Corps has been doing a very good job of. You know, this year we experienced very high lake levels very early. Mm hmm um, you know, and the Corps was doing everything they could to get those lake levels down to be able to deal with the rest of the spring runoff and spring rains. Um, you know, the thing to keep in mind, water hitting Lake Winnebago starts in the UP of Michigan. Mm -hmm. right. you, know, you know, we're at, you know, the Fox, the Fox River goes west to not quite Portage, but that's, you know, anybody who knows Wisconsin history, Portage got its name being the Portage between the Fox and the Wisconsin Rivers. Right. You know, so that's about where the Fox River starts. The Wolf River starts in, you know, the UP of Michigan. Right. And usually when they're getting a big rain event there, and if we're not seeing something, it takes about two weeks before it hits Lake Winnebago. Okay. So th those are some of the things. If they get a big rain event, and then two weeks later we get a big rain event, those waters are hitting the lake at the same time. Right. And that's when you really see big spikes in the lake. Mm -hmm. And that's where the Army Corps, they're, they're watching, they work very closely with the National Weather Service, mm -hmm. and they're watching that. So if they see, okay, that storm up north hit two weeks ago, it's getting close to Lake Winnebago, and we got another big one coming in, they're going to they're gonna be out at the dams opening up gates and trying to get more water out of the lake to try and stay within that operating band. Okay. Um, because they, they do understand how sensitive the city of Oshkosh is to, to fluctuations in the lake. Um, you know, there are some areas, you know, that during the peak lake elevation, which I think was 2008, there were actually some locations where until they could get the lake level down, we had streets that were underwater, not because they couldn't drain, but because the lake was that high that the, you know. It was at level with the lake. Yes. So there are, there are a few streets that are that close to, you know, lake level that if, you know, the lake is three inches above, you know, the Army Corps' operating band, there's going to be water sitting at that street level. So, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, our close communication with them, they understand and recognize that, and that's why they try to stick very closely with that um, 
operation plan that they have and they've made some minor modifications to it over the years but it's generally been about the same for about the last 20 years for those of you who are, who are not aware before james was our director of public works you were doing what i was a stormwater uh, engineering supervisor <laughs> yes <So. laughs> he's got a really good handle on all this <laughs> I have a question going back to the maps you gave us. I see most are concrete and some are asphalt. And that's something I've always wondered. What, how, what is the advantage of one, one over the other? Because I don't, I don't know. Um, a concrete street is going to have a longer life okay. than an asphalt street. OK. Um, a concrete street is going to generally require less maintenance over its lifetime than an asphalt street. Mm -hmm. um, so in asphalt the, streets put in as a kind of a temporary measure until you can put a concrete one in? Uh, certainly that would be one case. So if we have, you know, an older street, you know, and the, most of the older streets in the city are either a hot mix or a cold mix asphalt. Mm -hmm. um, when we reconstruct them completely, they go to concrete. Mm -hmm. You know, so as we were talking about earlier, if we've got utilities that have a good 20 or 30 years of life left on them, but the street surface is shot, you know, we'll look at either doing a, a an asphalt overlay of some kind, either a hot mix or a cold mix, you know, do a mill and overlay to extend that pavement life cycle to get out much closer to when the utilities are going to need to be replaced. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's one of those things that you don't want to put a 70 year pavement on top of a utility that's only got 30 years of life left. Right. So we're Cost is different too. Uh, actually, v um, concrete is very close in price to asphalt. Mm -hmm. Um, it, we've seen some fluctuations in recent years, but you know, obviously, you know, asphalt is a petroleum-based product. Um, you know, certainly, you know, gas prices have been moderate this year, but you know, if you look back a couple of years ago, you know, oil prices were so high. I think in cases, you know, concrete was actually going in cheaper than asphalt. Um, so it, you know, it does fluctuate a little bit. Um, that being said, you know, I think two years ago the concrete industry had some challenges where they were running low on cement powder to go into the concrete mixtures. So we saw a little bit of a price spike at that time too. So there's a little ebb and flow in each of them, but in general, on a life cycle cost analysis, concrete will come in less, just about every time. Running things all the time. Um, the two surfaces. Is asphalt as eco-friendly as concrete, or does it cause, does it have compounds in it that would hit, tend to enter the lake eventually? <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not a stumpy <laughs> question. No, it, it's, I, I mean, uh, it generally, you know, on a, a hot mix asphalt, once it goes down and it's rolled, you know, it, it's it's going to stay stable. Um, cold mix asphalt certainly on an extremely hot day, you might see a little bit of oil bleed out, but it's it's generally so thick and viscous that it's not. You know, if it gets rained on, it's not going to wash off. Um, where I've seen it and experienced it on my street is, you know, we get a little asphalt oil streaking into our driveways as we you know maybe turn the corner into our driveways. Um, you know, I've not really looked into you know any of the long-term impacts of you know d does does one pavement release you know compounds I really haven't gotten into that I would venture a guess that when it comes to overall water quality both are superior to having dirt roads where your total suspended solids in the <laughs> lake would be really really bad for the lake quality even gravel too I mean, yeah it's <laughs> <laughs> no doubt true. What's the less, at least of all <laughs> evils, right? <laughs> One other thing that you had addressed um, before when we spoke was uh, you had given a, a, an explanation of why Maine, well, we were talking about North Maine, but about how any street that can fall under more than one jurisdiction might take longer to complete or... Yeah, that, that's, that's a good point is, you know, it, Anybody might remember North Main Street was originally scheduled for reconstruction in 2015. It slid into 2016 primarily due to the requirements of the funding that were associated with the project. Um, the North Main Street project from New York to Murdoch is being managed by the Wisconsin Department of Transportation. Um, there are federal dollars associated with that project as well. So anytime you get into a project that's 
state or federally funded you know it, it just adds a few more layers of things that go into it in the particular case of North Main Street there were really two things that occurred one with the historical district along North Main Street it triggered some additional historical society and SHPO reviews to make sure that the reconstruction of the street would not have a negative impact on the historical properties in the historical district. Um, that review probably would have happened whether it was a local street, state, or federal street. Um, one of the other things that was kind of a bit of a, a shock and a change in the DOT is um, over the past six to eight months, uh, there's been an identification of a, a new endangered species, the uh, uh, long-eared northern bat, I think is the exact title it was. And so with state projects, because of the nesting time frame of this particular bat, you know, it doesn't, doesn't do anything prior to, I think, April 1. So you can do work for you know removal of trees prior to April 1 but between like April 1 and I don't remember if it was September or, or October you can't cut any trees down in areas where this particular species might utilize for nesting habitat mm -hmm. so you know in this particular case this year um, you may have noticed that you know the city forestry division along with a contractor was out cutting down all the trees oh, that yeah. needed to be removed um, prior to that, you know, deadline of, you know, thou shalt not cut down any more trees. <laughs> um, it, was, it was something that came up late in the design process and the review process, and the DOT came back to us and said, well, this is how we're addressing this particular habitat, is we're just going to say you can't cut trees down in this window. So we kind of had to move a little bit uh, quick and get all the trees removed that needed to be removed for the project. Um, but as a part of all of our projects, um, we actually have a general services agreement with um, UW Milwaukee's Cultural Resource Center. Um, they've got archaeologists on staff. We have them do records research and records review of all of our street reconstruction projects prior to submitting permit applications to the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, we had a couple of projects prior to implementing that process that got stalled due to potential archaeological concerns. Um, you know, in one case, a project got stalled because um, the database that the DNR was using for their records review had something mismapped. So, you know, we brought, you know, the archaeologist on staff, and she looked at it, and she said, well, no, this is mismapped. It's actually supposed to be about four blocks away. Got the mapping corrected, and then we got a letter saying, okay, your project's cleared. Um, as I looked at that, I'm like, okay, so that means the next project that <laughs> is in that area is going to be impacted. I'll keep that in mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what kind of archaeological things are there? Well, a as any as everybody knows, this area was you know very habited by you know, Native Americans. Mm -hmm. um, we've had projects where um, you know if we if we're doing a project in an area that was either known or suspected to be a village site or possibly a burial site you know those are two of the biggest things okay um, I had, we had a project um, up on the north side up by Asylum Point where you know it was known to be a village area so when we were constructing that uh, project uh, actually before we did it we went through because we we're going to be replacing a storm sewer in the exact same alignment as the previous one mm -hmm. So we actually went through and, and pulled the topsoil off. We had an archaeologist out on site while we were doing that, so they could document. Yes, you know, I can very clearly see this is where the old trench was. This area is already disturbed, and this is where we're going back. So they could document that we would not be disturbing mm -hmm. um, any artifacts that may be in place. The people in Evergreen were holding their breath because there was six foot deep, this foot wide, going from Westfield to Sawyer Creek, and if we got part way there and they found something, I think they'd be holed up. <laughs> and and that was, that's a part of why we go through that review yep. ahead of time. Um, we actually, you know, we had another project that we submitted and you know, got stalled on, and thankfully the, the staff um, from the resource center were able to come out and do a field walkthrough within days so they could document that we didn't have any issues. So um, we've been working with some of the staff there for several years. Um, 
one of the staff used to have her own company and then they were doing the exact same thing so they just merged with the cultural resource center at UW Milwaukee so that is another one of the things that we're you know constantly working on and trying to improve our process so we don't stall projects because you know we've got a very limited window of construction in Wisconsin Absolutely. and and we need to make sure that we've got everything in order before you know we need to start so that we can get it done before fall we call this construction season right yes two seasons uh, construction season and winter right <laughs> yes do any of the rest of you have any questions for James that have come up during the discussion I feel like when we do our outreach at farmers market it would be really cool to have like different colors of straws that represent different types of utilities that are underground and just having kids kind of layer those things to under and adults to understand that here's your pavement but here's everything else that's underneath it so that could be fun it could be fun just to help people kind of yeah. get it yeah and um, <laughs> I know there are some graphics that are out there that you know could probably help as well but yeah, yeah I mean nothing beats playing with a set of tinker toys when you're trying to figure right. something out. I know <laughs> <laughs> so that's how you do it <laughs> some days actually with with the way um, the CAD softwares have advanced and and the way we're actually utilizing them now um, we can actually take a three-dimensional look at all of our utility systems as we've got them designed in our street pavement and you know we have different designers working on different things and there have been times that you know we've had the ability to have somebody go through and look at those three-dimensional views you know underground if you will and we've identified some conflicts that we're able to fix before the plans went out to bid so you know we avoided some potential challenges in construction and potential change order requests from contractors you had mentioned that natural gas and water and sewer is underground. I assume there's also gas and fiber optics, maybe? Yeah, there's um, sanitary water and storm sewer are the three city-owned utilities that are primarily underground. Um, the city does have uh, communication, both fiber optic and um, regular coaxial cable, uh, some located underground, some located above ground. Um, anybody who's been over in the parking lot between City Hall and the safety building if you look in the one biofilter there's a marker post that says caution fiber optic cable underneath here you know it's a, a good example of an you know it's a city owned underground fiber optic communications cable uh, so but then yeah Wisconsin Public Service has gas and electric then you've got the various you know AT&T NTD um, you know however many other communication companies we have that are utilizing either above ground or underground wires or fiber optics depending on what they're doing a lot of them are uh, getting over to all fiber networks is that all that's underground <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah there, there's there's you know like, uh, communications you know, you've got telephone television internet um, gas electric water sanitary storm and you know any anything else that might appear um, you know one of the things you know if you've ever driven by a construction site you see all the little flags and the little paint markings and stuff you know that's diggers hotline we've actually got some links on the public works website now to help understand you know what all those flags mean and and what they're locating and marking and you know we've linked out to the diggers hotline website for some of that information too awesome well thank you so much for coming and sharing all this you can see why I didn't want to try to just tell you what I thought I heard him say <laughs> because there was a lot to it but it kind of will help us understand when we're trying to recommend something why it needs to maybe be reviewed by many different places kind of like why we're pushing always for collaboration and communication between the different departments and committees yeah and I, I think you know that's you know like I said before you know it was one of the biggest things when forestry c came to us and said hey here's what we got going this year we we're able to head off some potential disasters by you know just saying hey you know we got this here you know don't do that in this area um, you know I think that's been one of the biggest things that you know ha has really improved over the last four or five years is um, you know a lot more cross-department communication and understanding of what everybody else has got going on out there well feel free to send stuff to us anytime that you would need to too we're here for you <laughs> all right <laughs> okay well thank you so thank you. much speaking thank of you.
You're welcome. I just heard someone talking about streets, and they said that Wisconsin is one of the states with the most paved streets in the country, as opposed to gravel streets, primarily to get milk to the market. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a historical reason. Right. I know when I moved to Wisconsin, I was shocked at how many streets, how many roads there are. Because where I'm from in Colorado, you might have to drive four hours to get somewhere if the road's washed right. out. Here you only have to go to a, go a mile and there's a county road that goes across. And they all have letters and they all change at every county line. And it was very odd to move here and, and see so many streets when you're not used to it. You guys probably don't even appreciate that. Okay, well, next on our agenda then is our report on the spring rain barrel workshop. I will be back. Can I take, I need to go down for five minutes? I'll be back. Yes, yes. Would you like to go ahead with sure, that? Sure, we can speak to it a little bit. So we had the spring <coughs> rain barrel workshop uh, a couple weekends ago, and there were 16 total participants. Um, I think overall it went really well. Everyone seemed to have a good time. Um, we are able to have another rain barrel workshop because we signed up for 30, but we only used 16. Um, so I guess the options that we have moving forward is we can run a program ourselves with the remaining 14 barrels and kits, or we can work with Fox Wolf Watershed Alliance again to just run a duplicative uh, workshop later, either in the summer or fall. Um, but overall, it seemed like it's a good, good program that continues to kind of revolve the funds that we did get um, as part of the grant. Um, and like I said, this is the fourth rain barrel workshop that we've um, mm -hmm. offered with the $2,000 grant that we received. So. Um, I think it's a good use of the funding and it's, it's the gift that keeps on giving it is, yeah. and what age level were the participants um, it ranged um, we had families there that had you know a two-year-old child with good. helping um, we had <laughs> you know 30 30 year olds um, and then we had retirees so mm. it really ranged in terms of who was participating at this workshop and um, I was very pleased with the turnout um, given kind of the short time frame that we had to promote it so good. Yeah. rain barrels are good for everybody huh yes, they are. and we did promote the stormwater credit program that we have um, here with the city so hopefully you know participants will go back and install their rain barrels and then apply for that credit to save some money on their stormwater bills so super Okay, we, um, and I apologize, this is totally my fault that you did not have this to look over before, but we do have the um, impervious surface brochure in front of us now, and I think that it's probably ready to go. If you see anything on it that you, and I'll, you know, you don't have to do it right this very minute, but, um, well, do we have to approve this? Yeah, I guess you do have to do it right this very minute. Um, <laughs> however, if you do find something later and, and want to let Lizzie or me know, we could probably still change a comma or something. But um, this is the information that we're hoping to publish. And are we hoping at some point to put this in with water bills or just to make it available at City Hall? We're going to make it available at City Hall. We'll have it at our um, farmer's market booth and other and promotional Available activities. on the website. Yep, yep. Oh, um, I'd like to thank Kim for doing this. It's got a lot of good information. I'd like to thank Lizzie for some mighty fine photos there. And um, so thanks, guys. I didn't have to do anything on this one. <laughs> is there anything anyone sees? Or I would entertain a motion to accept it as is and go ahead and proceed with printing it for our farmer's markets. Did you see anything? Jen, you? No, I had. Step nice. Good. Yep, I think Jan and Jan and Margie were the eagle eyes, and mm. <laughs> I apologize after looking at it so many times, I just couldn't, <laughs> couldn't look at it. It's anymore. very hard when you write and type it to then look at it with. And then, yeah, I yeah. totally get and it. After you guys put it on someone's air, it's I'm called going. teamwork, honey. We're okay. supposed to yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah. good work, team. Oh, yes. Okay. In which case, I well, will maybe approve. we could have just one capital here. 
Which one? Never mind. It's <laughs> She's kidding. Are you sure? I, my eyes are, are sure? not good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I did hear a motion from Lerton to um, proceed with this. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, all in favor of moving ahead with this impervious surface brochure, say aye. 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 Let's do it. All right. Then, speaking of farmer's market, we do have an update on our farmer's market. We've got um, our approval for dates that we will be there. This year we will be at W106, which I forgot to look exactly where that right is. Right across from Kits and File. Okay, on the other side of the street from Kits and File? On the same side. Same of side as Kits and File. Okay. And we will be there this year on July 9th. And you'll remember there was a doodle for this. Um, August 13th, September 3rd, and October 1st. So we have a list somewhere of people who had previously said they could make it, but we can also re-invite people at each yeah. time. Yeah, I think the participants were Samara. I know Robert said he was available, and Margie, I think I picked the dates that you and Samara both could make it, so hopefully between the two of you, it'll work out, or three of you, it'll work out. I okay. should be able to make some as well. Yeah, everybody can, now that we have the dates, you can take a look at your calendar and see if, you know, you'd like to, to share some of that fun, because it is, it's fun. It is. Yes. All righty. Um, then we move on to our Ickley Milestone 2 report. Um, yeah, this has been something that now we want to bring, um, have a workshop with council, right? And I have been in negotiations with Darren, who is in negotiations with the greater powers that be, um, for when we will be having that workshop, and we haven't been able to nail it down yet. But we are trying to make it a time that works for both our committee, our, our board, and the city council. So check your email. If I send you something, please open it. Um, and we'll just... Who are you talking to, really? I don't know, really. <laughs> I'll try to be more... Um, I'll try to be better in my subject lines, too. <laughs> um, so that is upcoming probably within the next six weeks, I would bet it farthest out um, but I don't know when yet so have you heard anything beyond that okay they were talking to me while you were gone so uh, okay so that's that report do we have any agenda items for future meetings all right um, I'd like to talk about the shoreland restoration and things that have been going on with that at a future meeting um, and I would propose that we um, adopt a cleanup day. Um, one thing that we're doing this year is encouraging people or groups to sign up for a day where they um, help with the cleanup so that um, there is more ownership of the site and just kind of, sure. you know, people enjoying the experience. So. Um, I can send out the list of I was going to say, things. can, can you send that to Liz and let her um, share it with all of us so sure. we could, yep. and maybe we'll want to do a doodle for that or something to see what day might work. I think that's a great idea. Um, because you and I both were on the, or have seen the, rest, the Shoreland Restoration communications, but not everybody's on that list. Right. And basically, um, that's something that Michelle has taken over this year and is doing a wonderful job with. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate but, it. And it is a lot of work. But, um, yes. And she would like some help with it. So, um, But there are many, many groups and many people that are interested in this area and are helpful. But she very wisely has asked different groups to adopt particular days. It's like cleaning up the highway, you know? So... We don't have to do the out. Let's let's do the restoration area instead. Work with the schools at all as a project for some school, either college class or high school. Uh, we have had help from different um, college classes. We had actually we had the Daisy Scouts um, from St. Francis Cabrini um, at our first opening day, so that was a lot of fun. So sure. they really enjoyed that. They got to plant some low growth plants yeah, and take right. you know, some yep, things yep. home. And Good. I think they actually planted some things at their school then and started their own uh, native planting site. So that was really cool. Scouts um, sometimes want a project. Mm -hmm. 
It's been a while since I, I don't know what the current projects are but I remember. <laughs> right and there have been lots of good um, partnerships and collaborations with Webster Stanley good and, good, um, good or Emmeline Cook I believe actually and then just different area schools um, have been yeah. Webster would do too well and initially we had a lot of help from um, different classes at UWO and, and faculty members yep. too who, who tend to participate and, and yep. good. so yeah there's it's it's very much a community area which is awesome Okay, well, um, I would think we could do that in August. Is that a good time for you to present something on that? Uh, yeah, that's, yep, I think that'd be a great idea. We will not be having a meeting in July because it falls on July 4th and, you know, we're busy that day. Or whatever day it would be, it's right on, yeah. it is. It is, yeah. I think yeah. it is right on July. the 4th, so. So we'll be skipping July. Um, is there anything else that anyone would like to have us address at a future meeting? I just uh, I just want to be sure we have a work session after this is that correct? Um, yes it probably won't be a real long one. Okay well I want to we had some good momentum going on the beekeeping ordinance and I want to keep that alive. So, okay, so I don't know that might come out of the work session but if I have to notice it right now that I want to keep it alive I'm putting it there if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, and I don't know if um, UW students are going to continue working on that when they come back in the fall, but I just want to be sure that it stays alive. Good plan. It would be nice if it would be in effect for like next year. Yeah. Um, Does it take people need to know by January if they're going to be able to have bees or not in the city by January because that's when they start putting orders in to buy their bee equipment and All ordering right. their yeah. colonies to receive in um, okay to receive in April or May and so it'd be nice if we could have this maybe resolved or at least moving clearly in a certain direction so people would know what they could do yeah. if they should order or not okay makes sense anybody else have anything okay then I would entertain a motion to adjourn wait oh, oh. Oh, all this sorry. stuff goes in the workshop. Oh. <laughs> Gosh, I'm thinking I read all those things. <laughs> We're coming to that. Um, okay, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Let's do it. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Ready to adjourn. We are adjourned.